Afternoon, everybody. I have a few announcements at the top uh, to share with you before I turn to your questions. Uh, first, I want to update you on the department's response to and preparations for Hurricane Matthew. Secretary Carter has been receiving regular briefings on those efforts, and he and the rest of the department will be tracking the storm closely and staying engaged in the days ahead as it threatens the U.S. East Coast. In response to the hurricane's impact in the Caribbean and a request from the U.S. Agency for International Development, Secretary Carter has granted approval for Southcom to expend up to $11 million of overseas humanitarian disaster and civic aid funds to provide disaster relief support, including transportation support in the Caribbean, airfield and port assessments, as well as airfield operations support. And as Admiral Tidd pointed out yesterday uh, in his briefing with you all, uh, U.S. Southern Command stood up Joint Task Force Matthew to oversee U.S. military relief efforts in Haiti. It's commanded by Rear Admiral Cedric Pringle. Uh, their team arrived in Port-au-Prince, Haiti uh, just yesterday. Meanwhile, NORTHCOM continues to coordinate with SOUTHCOM, FEMA, the military services, the State Department, East Coast states, and others to ensure that DOD is able to respond to requests for assistance from and support FEMA mission assignments as needed for East Coast states as well as the Bahamas. In addition, NORTHCOM has identified four facilities as FEMA installation support bases. These areas will provide staging areas for trucks, trailers, and other equipment and personnel. They are North Auxiliary Field, which is north of Charleston, South Carolina, Albany Marine Corps Logistics Base in Georgia, as well as Fort Bragg in North Carolina and Fort A.T. Hill in Virginia. The services continue to take prudent measures to protect their people and to position their platforms clear of the storm and its path. As you know, the National Guard trains year-round to ensure that they are ready to protect and assist citizens during disasters and emergencies. The Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina National Guard are prepared for mobilization. In all, 4,500 Guardsmen have been mobilized by their respective state governors in preparation for Hurricane Matthew. One scheduling note for you regarding the Secretary. This morning, as part of his continuing outreach to the business and technology communities, the Secretary met with representatives of the Aerospace Industries Association, the National Defense Industrial Association, and the Professional Services Council. The meeting took place at AIA's offices. It was a very productive session with some of the DOD's key industrial partners, where the Secretary discussed uh, some of the nation's security challenges, innovation, the acquisition process, and other issues with those representatives from industry. Also want to provide you with uh, updates to two items that we discussed on Tuesday. We have now determined that Egyptian national Abu al-Farai al-Mazri, also known as Ahmad Salama Mabruk, one of al-Qaeda's most senior leaders, was killed in an American airstrike near Idlib, Syria on Monday. His death is a significant disruption to al-Qaeda's senior leadership and again a blow to their ability to plot external attacks. And finally, as you may have seen, the department released the name of the American soldier, uh, Staff Sergeant, Army Staff Sergeant Adam S. Thomas, killed on Tuesday in Nangarhar Province, Afghanistan. Staff Sergeant Thomas was the first American service member killed in a counter-ISIL operation in Afghanistan. Secretary Carter and the entire department offer their condolences to Staff Sergeant Thomas and his fam Thomas's family. And even as we mourn the loss of Staff Sergeant Thomas, the United States will continue to lead the campaign to deliver ISIL the lasting defeat it deserves and to combat ISIL's metastases everywhere they emerge around the world, including in Afghanistan. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Bob. Uh, Peter, today the Russian Ministry of Defense uh, issued a statement saying that uh, its air defense missile crews in Syria are either not able to or will not, at any rate, be participating in the air deconfliction process with the U.S. that the aircraft crews have. Um, the implication seeming to be that any U.S. aircraft that are bombing Syrian targets could get shot down by these Russian SAMs. I wonder if you have any comment about that or taking any precaution? Well, uh, as, as you know, Bob, we are always taking precautions uh, with regard to the safety of our air crews. As I said to you all on Tuesday, this is something that is uh, a top priority for us, and not just for U.S. air crews, of course, coalition air crews. We will continue to do that, to take every step necessary to ensure that our air crews operate uh, in as safe uh, a fashion as possible over Syria. Uh, that memorandum of understanding, that safety line of communication with the Russians, despite our differences in the, with the Russians, has been effective in reducing 
uh, risks to our pilots, to our air crews, as well as to Russian air crews. It's been an effective means of communication to avoid misunderstanding and miscalculation. And we will continue to employ that line of communication in an appropriate fashion. We would encourage the Russians to do the same. Are you concerned that the statement reflects a threat to U.S. Uh, aircraft? Well, again, I'll leave it to the Russians to describe what the purpose of that system, those systems are, are, are for. And I will highlight once again uh, that their stated intent in going into Syria was to target uh, groups like al-Nusra uh, and uh, ISIL, and that those groups do not operate uh, aircraft. And so we would continue to have con concerns about uh, uh, what uh, purpose they're serving in those locations. and. Uh, more importantly, we'll continue to conduct our operations uh, as we have uh, for months now over Syria, and we'll continue to do so uh, taking every uh, possible step we need to to ensure the safety of our air crews, coalition air crews in Syria. Go ahead. Okay. Yes, Joe, you uh, clearly have a follow-up. To follow up on Bob's sure. question, I want to go back to what the Russian minister said. He said that it must be understood that Russian air defense missile crews will unlikely have time to clarify via the hotline. Uh, he, he's talking about the cooperation with, uh, with the United States. Again, are you concerned about what he said? Uh, I'd be concerned like about this is, any... Uh, this, is, this is something that the Russians have changed their uh, line of communications with, 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 with the United States? Uh, Joe, as I said before, we've had... Uh, this line of communication, the MOU, has up to this point, we believe, served its purpose in avoiding misunderstanding and miscalculation, in avoiding uh, potential problems in the air over Syria, and it's been an effective means of, of communicating uh, with the Russians at a time when we continue to have very significant difference with the Russians and their activities in Syria. We continue to have uh, differences with them. But this is an opportunity both that MOU uh, and that safety line of communication to avoid misunderstandings and miscalculations on the Russian side, uh, as well as to explain and articulate what our folks are, are doing. We'll continue to use that. We'll leave it to the Russians to, to participate in that as they see fit. We certainly would encourage them to, to continue to use that line of communication for its purpose of, of deconfliction. Yes, Ryan. So just following up on the Russian <coughs> statement, they also implied that the strike in near Deir Ezzor that the U.S. conducted that may have killed some Syrian security personnel, they implied that that may have not have been an accident. I know there's an investigation go ongoing into what exactly happened. Will there be any plan to share the results of the investigation with Russia at any point? As you know, when we conduct these uh, assessments and these reviews, uh, we will share whatever information we get with uh, uh, not just uh, with you all, but with a wider audience. Um, we'll be as transparent as we can be as we, as we are with those investigations. Uh, we're not, uh, to my knowledge, planning anything special for the, for the Russians. If they have questions, we'll be, uh, make every effort to, to answer them as, as we've tried to answer other questions. Um, but there is an investigation ongoing, and I don't want to prejudge the outcome of that investigation. Yes, Idris. Uh, very quickly on Afghanistan, do you have an update on the situation in Kunduz? Uh, yeah, my understanding is it's uh, st in a situation not unlike uh, yesterday that the government continues to control uh, Kunduz. There is still uh, sporadic fighting in certain locations. Uh, and the bottom line is the Taliban has tried to take uh, the city of Kunduz and has uh, so far been unable to achieve that uh, ob objective. Um, again, there's still isolated pockets of Taliban resistance within the city, uh, conducting, as it's been described to me, sort of harassing attacks. Uh, but the Afghan uh, security forces uh, continue to hold the city, continue to, uh, to target as safely as they can within the urban confines of Kunduz, uh, those, uh, uh, those Taliban fighters, uh, being very cognizant of the risk of civilian casualties. I mean, generally speaking now, broadly, the United States has been in Afghanistan for 15 years. Uh, they've lost thousands of soldiers, one earlier this week. Many more Afghan soldiers have died, hundreds of billions have been spent, and yet, you know, we're talking about urban centers in Afghanistan still being contested. How is the military strategy, you know, anything but, you know, frankly, a failure at this point, where we're still talking about the Taliban holding positions? Um, how is it not a failure? I, I think General Nicholson uh, spoke to this uh, 
quite clearly the other day when, when he uh, addressed you all. This is an effort, an ongoing effort, uh, to allow the government of Afghanistan, the people of Afghanistan, to secure their own country uh, with the support and help of uh, an international coalition uh, led, of course, by the United States, other NATO members. We are doing what we can to allow them to take control of the security situation on their own. What you're seeing in Kunduz, what you're seeing in other parts of Afghanistan is uh, not a, a total surprise. This is still part of the fighting season. The Taliban would like to take uh, population centers. They've had a much harder time, as General Nicholson has pointed out, being able to take population areas. And the Afghan government, the Afghan security forces are carrying out their own plan, their own campaign to try and, uh, and uh, prevent uh, the Taliban from doing that. They have prioritized population areas over more rural areas in some instances because of uh, the resources they have at this particular moment in time, the capabilities they have. We are working very aggressively to bolster their capabilities, to provide the support um, that they need to be able to do this on their own. And what you're seeing in Kunduz is, is, yes, a challenge to the Afghan security forces posed by the Taliban, but also, uh, as we've talked about, the resiliency of these forces, the improvement of these forces to be able to do this uh, in, in a way that they've been able to in the last uh, a few days. This is capabilities they didn't necessarily have some time back. So, yes, it is uh, absolutely a a uh, dangerous situation in Afghanistan, a challenging situation for the Afghan government, and certainly for the Afghan forces who have sacrificed mightily to defend their own country. Um, but uh, I think, as, uh, as General Nicholson has pointed out, in terms of being able to maintain and control population areas, the Afghan security forces are doing a much better job. They're carrying out their campaign plan. And if you look at where the Taliban has tried to strike, their ability to hold those population areas uh, has not been successful. Uh, in this most recent round of fighting, as challenging as it's been for the Afghan security forces. One last question I've asked, I, I think about 40-odd um, Afghan troops in the United States have gone missing. Um, can you talk about some of the steps you're taking to make sure that doesn't happen as frequently in the future? Well, Idris, as you know, because I, I, I know you spoke to some of our uh, staff about this, all the, those Afghan uh, trainees who come to the United States, first of all, go through a, a, a vetting process to be able to qualify to come here to the United States. Uh, in those instances where they have gone uh, missing, and uh, uh, this has been something we've, we've had to deal with over the years. We've been training Afghans in this country for some time. Uh, I think more than 2,000 have been trained uh, even in, in the last few years alone. Um, uh, there's a notification process that we go through, of course, trying to determine uh, where these people are of the people who uh, have been missing in uh, over the last uh, two years or so, I believe uh, the number that was provided to you was uh, somewhere around 40, uh, more than 40 individuals. There are 32. We understand the status of those people. Um, and uh, again, every effort's made to try and determine uh, where these people have gone, what the reasons are. Uh, in some cases, they've gone home. In some cases, uh, there have been efforts, as I understand it, to go to Canada. Uh, some have uh, uh, sought to legally. Um, remain in the United States, uh, and so there are different explanations for each one of these circumstances. But these are people who have vetted, and again, when there is someone who is officially considered absent without leave, there is a very formal process in which we uh, notify not only the Department of Homeland Security, but also Customs and Immigration Enforcement, uh, uh, certainly the Afghan government. Um, there are a range of steps that are taken in each and every case uh, to try and determine the status of those individuals. Lucas. Just to follow up, out of the 40-odd Afghans that are missing, how many have been found? Um, as I said, uh, I think the number that I saw since January of 2015, um, there have been more than 40 who have uh, gone AWOL, and I believe 32 uh, we've been able to determine their status. When you say determine their status, does that mean you found them? They're here in America or Canada, but you know where they are? Yes. And just one more on the just on the storm, um, is, is the Secretary Wang uh, holding back these ships before they deploy to Haiti just to see what kind of potential devastation happens here on U.S. shores? Uh, of course, the, the Secretary and, uh, you know, the uh, command leadership here, um, there'll be decisions will be made, uh, as I think Admiral Tidd uh, spoke to uh, yesterday, uh, depending on uh, the needs. Uh, going forward, exactly what impact the storm has, not only uh, in uh, those in the Caribbean, 
but also here in the, in the United States. Right now, those ships, one of our concerns, of course, is to get those ships out of the way of uh, the storm. And so decisions will be made based on what the greatest need is and, and capabilities that certain uh, ships provide, if, in fact, they're needed at all. And uh, again, there'll be a myriad of factors that, are, that weigh into that, as I think Admiral Ted weighed in yesterday. Yes, Laurent. Um, has the, 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 gov the government of Haiti asked for, for, the, for the help of these ships? Uh, because there are reports uh, saying that the Haiti government has, has, has uh, asked uh, for help. Um, I know that we're, we're providing help. As you know, there are helicopters in Haiti right now, and we're providing uh, assistance. We have the team on the ground in Haiti right now. Uh, so we, the United States and the Department of Defense, is providing uh, assistance to Haiti as we speak. Uh, and we'll continue to do so. And I think the decisions will be made in coordination, of course, with the, uh, our interagency colleagues and uh, with the government of Haiti as our team gets stood up there. And uh, you know about uh, uh, the team that we have based in Port-au-Prince right now. They'll be working with the Haitian government. Is the government of Haiti asking for such means as, such, uh, as, as the one that the ships, the free ships, can provide? Um, I'm not aware of a, of a specific request for a capability on board one of those ships. I, I know that we're in communication with the government of Haiti about providing assistance, and we are uh, providing assistance. Uh, and of course, we'll review every single request made to see um, uh, the best way for the United States government to be able to handle that, whether or not it's something the Department of Defense does or uh, perhaps, again, one of our interagency colleagues. We'll be working closely. USAID obviously plays a lead role in all this, and we'll continue to, to coordinate closely with them. Carla. Thank you. Um, on the storm, can you give us a breakdown of the U.S. troops that are in Haiti right now and who's expected to arrive in the next coming days? Let me make sure I have the very latest, uh, Carla. So I'm going to take that question and, and we'll get back to you uh, specifically because I, I, I know there have been some movements in the, in the last little bit. I, I mentioned the helicopters, uh, the team that just landed there. I want to make sure I can give you specific numbers, uh, exactly how many U.S. forces are in Haiti at this moment. So well, I'll get that for you after this. Okay, thank you. And on Somalia, the strike on the 28th, do we mm -hmm. have an update on the investigation? Uh, I don't have anything, just that the investigation is ongoing. Um, and, you know, as soon as we have something, we'll be happy to share it with you. But I don't have anything since you and I spoke last. Yes, Kasim. Uh, Peter, there are <coughs> some reports coming from Iraq uh, claiming that uh, Colonel Dorian uh, called Turkish military presence in northern Iraq as illegal and called Turks as invaders. Uh, I got a statement from here saying that these are false, but I wonder about Pentagon's general assessment of Pentagon itself about Turkish armed forces presence in northern Iraq. Yeah. Um, again, you, you, my understanding is that the, the question about uh, uh, the words that were Represented that was not factually correct as to what uh, Colonel Dorian said. <clears throat> Our views on, on this uh, uh, should be well known, and, and this is uh, something for uh, the Turkish government and the, the government of Iraq uh, to speak to, and uh, and uh, we would urge them, uh, th those two governments, to to speak to this issue and the presence of, of Turkish troops in in Iraq. Uh, this is something that we feel those two governments uh, should be able to speak to most directly. Um, and uh, our, the view of the United States has been that, uh, of course, the sovereign territory of Iraq, uh, that the Iraqi government should uh, be able to uh, uh, speak to uh, foreign troops on its soil. And uh, that's something that, uh, again, this is a, a sovereign issue for the, for the government of Iraq. You and some kind of, by saying that it's a sovereign right of Iraqi government to, you know, to decide about the foreign troops on its territories. Mm -hmm. So do you imply that Turks are there like without request or knowledge or consent of the Iraqi government? I, Have you I, spoke to any of the parties about the issue? This is, this is an issue for the government of Turkey and the government of Iraq uh, to, to speak to. Um, the government of Iraq can answer that question. That's not something I can answer from this podium. Uh, and uh, again, we are the coalition of which Turkey is a member is focused uh, very much on uh, on ridding Iraq uh, of, uh, of uh, the ISIL threat, uh, Syria as well. And uh, uh, that will remain our focus, and we think there's a ample opportunity for the coalition to work very closely with the government of Iraq to achieve that goal. Jenny.
Thank you, uh, Peter. For the North Korea's uh, um, completely disposal of uh, nuclear weapons, uh, it seems to be a uh, United States diplomatic option is, looks like, went out power forever. It looks like, you know, for a while against the North Korea. What the U.S. will take military strikes near the future against the North Korea? Jane, I'm sorry, I didn't totally understand your, your question there. Could you repeat the question? What part of? I said the U.S. Since uh, U.S. Uh, yeah. State Department, I asked the question last week. Yeah. They don't uh, diplomatically solve this problem. It doesn't work because there are so many talks going on, but it not work. That, that diplomacy has run its course? Is that your question? Yes. So yeah. what uh, will the U.S. take military action to North Korea near the future? Only Jenny, I, I, I think you know our, our, our position on this and that the United States uh, continues to work uh, shoulder to shoulder with our South Korean allies, our other allies in the region, to defend uh, against the threat posed by North Korea. And we, our State Department colleagues, will continue to encourage uh, the North Koreans to, to take the steps necessary to reduce the tensions uh, on the Korean Peninsula. and. Uh, in the meantime, uh, given the actions we've seen from the North Koreans, we'll continue to take the necessary steps we need to to protect the American people and protect our allies in the region. And uh, I I'm not going to get into military movements or decisions in the, in the future, but this is a position we've had as allies of South Korea for, for years, and we'll continue to stand by our allies uh, in that part of the world. Are there any scenario for beheading North Korean Kim Jong Un, just like beheading of uh, Osama bin Laden. Uh, Do you have any beheading uh, operation? We, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is a very serious topic, and uh, again, I'm just going to reiterate uh, our intention here. Uh, our goal has always been to. Uh, reduce tensions on the Korean Peninsula, that there are steps that the North Koreans can take to do that. Uh, we certainly encourage a, a, a diplomatic resolution of uh, this situation. Uh, and there have been ample opportunities for the North Koreans to pursue diplomacy, and there still are. Um, but uh, uh, in the meantime, the Department of Defense will continue to take the steps we need to uh, to ensure the safety of the American people uh, and also, of course, uh, ensure the safety of our allies in the region. So. Do you remember two days ago that the uh, vice president uh, debate? They uh, mentioned about the preemptive, uh, you know, strike to North Korea. So, possibility of you have a special forces in South Korea, so you have got to something. Um, I am going to leave the political debate to uh, the campaign season and. Uh, uh, again, I'll leave it to the candidates to speak to their own views on this issue, but I'm speaking on behalf of the Department of Defense, and I think it's uh, clear where, where, our, where we are with regard to this issue. So, other questions? Yes, how are you? Um, so, in the last couple of days, there have been a series of disclosures about uh, the potential that another contractor got access to highly sensitive material and removed it from um, the unintelligence community network. Is the department satisfied that its current safeguards against the insider threat are adequate? And have there been new or uh, renewed considerations on potential um, adjustments to the policy to protect against the insider threat? Um, uh, you know that I, uh, because this is a law enforcement matter, I can't speak specifically to uh, any individual uh, case here. Um, this is obviously an issue that we take very seriously. Uh, and that the, the government as a whole takes very seriously. And there have been changes, as you know, put in place uh, since uh, uh, the revelations uh, from Edward Snowden. Uh, and we believe uh, those changes have uh, made a difference. Uh, and this is something we'll continue to, uh, to watch very carefully. And uh, uh, everyone in the Department of Defense needs to take the issue of uh, the protection of sensitive information very, very seriously. And that is impressed upon everyone certainly within this institution and will continue to be. So. Yes, Ryan. I think that one of the 
one other question on, on the Major General Lewis uh, inspect, uh, Inspector General's report. Um, I, I saw a statement from the Secretary. Is there a concern that someone with such access to the Secretary, such high level access, would ex display such poor judgment? I mean, is, is this building concerned about that and, and kind of the vetting that went on? Secretary, uh, you saw the Secretary's statement. Um, there's a process that's in place here. Uh, the Army will now uh, consider uh, this particular case and what happens. So the Secretary does not want to say anything at this point that could uh, in any way undermine that process. Um, I'll just go back to what the Secretary said in his statement uh, this morning, and that is he expects the highest uh, possible standards of conduct by men and women in this department, especially those in positions of senior leadership. Uh, that is an expectation he has set from the very start of his time here, and it is something that is crystal clear to everyone who serves with him. Yes? Just going back to Russia really quickly, uh, given the saber-rattling comments and the aggression and now the deployment of the S-300 and the 400 in Syria, can the Pentagon state unequivocally that this will not have an effect on U.S. airstrikes and uh, operations in the region? Our operations will continue. Laurent? Edward Snowden is said to be one of the potential uh, uh, people to be awarded the uh, Nobel Prize. Uh, what is, the, what is the, the, the reaction of DOD to know that Snowden is on uh, such a, a short list? Uh, I don't have a comment on that. Lucas. Peter, did the Secretary issue a statement after the identity of the Green Beret who was killed in Afghanistan was released? Did the Secretary issue a statement? We just spoke here from the podium. That, didn't it? kind of uh, protocol for the Secretary to issue a statement, uh, some kind of condolence statement when the name is released? I'm sorry, Luke, so, um, obviously the Secretary feels very strongly about this. We spoke about this on Tuesday and Thursday, um, and he's expressed his condolences, as you just heard from me, uh, at this podium uh, to uh, Staff Sergeant Thomas's family uh, and to his teammates as well, and to all those who uh, mourn the loss of a uh, of a brave and patriotic American who was serving his country in Afghanistan. Uh, this is uh, something that this secretary takes uh, this responsibility to put Americans in harm's way very, very seriously. And uh, I, the comments today should uh, reflect uh, the very serious uh, significance he places upon this news. Is there any uh, reconsideration into the, how he died? Uh, you mentioned that there was an ongoing investigation but can you say that he was killed in combat? Uh, Lucas, uh, you and I spoke about this before. Uh, he was engaged in a, not just in a combat situation, he was, as we now understand it, there was fire coming at that time. This was someone who was absolutely fighting on behalf of uh, the safety and security of the American people and defending this country. Uh, and he was, uh, you can call it, it was absolutely combat. Uh, and uh, he was doing it in, uh, in a way that, again, trying to take the fight to ISIL, where it's metastasized in Afghanistan, trying to protect the American people. Uh, he should be honored for that sacrifice. And uh, certainly the Secretary of Defense and everyone in this building, uh, we mourn his loss. We uh, acknowledge the sacrifice he's made on behalf of, uh, of this country. Uh, and that is not lost on any of us here in this building. Carlos. The visiting delegation from Pakistan um, here in D.C. recently announced that the country would begin joint uh, military exercises with Russia and also restart um, uh, weapon buys from, uh, from Russia as well. And um, these officials noted that part of the motivation for this was the strengthening military ties between the U.S. and India. Now, given some of the, um, some of the recent um, uh, conflict in the Kashmir region going on, I mean, does this announcement, has this sort of um, raised any red flags here in the building as far as the relationship between the U.S. and Pakistan militarily and the ties between the uh, U.S. And, and India? Uh, Carlos, I'm sure you've heard the, the Secretary speak to this, that we don't, we don't view these relationships as a zero-sum situation. We have a relationship with India. We have a relationship with, with Pakistan, um, longstanding relationship. And uh, there's security interests that we share with Pakistan, that we also uh, have separate security interests we have with, with India. Uh, and we'll continue to, to look at the relationships in, in, in that light. Um, and uh, uh, so that's the way we view this. Uh, it is not 
a zero-sum situation, and we'll continue to have uh, ongoing conversations, military conversations with the Pakistanis, particularly on the subject of counterterrorism, where we have a shared security interest, uh, and we'll continue to uh, to foster a, a, a strengthening defense relationship with uh, with India. Uh, you have noted, of course, the the uh, engagements that the Secretary has had with Minister Parikar. Uh, this is an important relationship, a growing relationship, one we think is uh, very important to the region uh, and, uh, and will continue to be uh, uh, one that the Secretary will be looking to develop in the, in the months and years ahead. Okay. Thanks, everybody.